During a recent retro session, I was thinking about my first experiences with computers, back in the mid 80s. It was with the computer my uncle had back then, and I have tried for the longest time to get my hands on one of those models, but they usually go on eBay for way too much money. But back home, and also back in the present time, I did a quick search for it, and behold, an affordable version was up for buy now. The only potential issue with it was, it is a US model and uses 110 volt 60 hertz and NTSC while I would ideally have 240 volts 50 hertz and PAL. While I was waiting for it to arrive, I read up on the hardware manuals and checked to see if a conversion was possible. The NTSC would not be much of a problem, as modern TVs can deal with it just fine, but the power supply would have to undergo extensive modifications. And finally, after a week of waiting, it arrived. Behold, the Commodore 64 Luggable, or SX64 Executive as it was known. I'm afraid to say that the packaging was suboptimal. The 10 kg computer was thrown into a box and one sheet of bubble wrap was added, mostly for decoration I assume, amongst some newspaper pieces. Needless to say, it took some damage in the process. I only realized the broken part of the keyboard case later. Nah. The listing also included the keyboard cable, which is lost most of the time, and a fast load cartridge. Naturally, the case was a bit scratched and everything was dusty, but besides those minor issues, it seemed nice and complete. Cleaning the case was done in an easy fashion. Just dunk the plastic and aluminium parts into the sink, scrub and rinse. Then put up for drying and done. The next steps in my plan, recapping that sucker and modifying the power supply and giving it a good cleaning while it's open. Oh boy, there are lots of screws in that thing. To tackle the power supply, I checked and compared EU and US versions. Not good. I would need different rectifiers, some caps and a transistor, as well as a new primary transformer. The latter one was a real showstopper. Time for plan B! I did some searching and found a power brick style power supply that would fit the required power output and was only about a third of the original size. Yay! I cleaned the PCBs and reseated the chips along with some contact cleaning fluid. I did make sure that it was non-conductive before applying it to the sockets, yes. The investment for the desoldering iron paid off nicely. I went through the capacitors like a breeze. The new ones arrived after some waiting. After putting everything together and connecting the new PSU, the big moment was finally here. Would it power on? Would I get zapped by the 14 kV CRT voltage? Tune in next week to find out! Just kidding. Bummer.
let's start the troubleshooting process. At least the screen seems to work okay. Probing the individual pins of one of the chips, I realized that the outputs were at 2.4 volt DC. Not good. It's supposed to be TTL level signals and getting 2.4 volt average would work, but my scope showed plain DC. Also, the chip got extremely hot after a few seconds of powering on. At last, the PLA chip arrived and I put it in and still see an empty screen. At least the logic levels are up and running fine. I suspect the MPU and hope that it's not the VIC chip. I took this opportunity to finally mount the power supply into the back panel and add copious amounts of heat paste. I also added a hidden reset switch. I decided that it's time to plug it into the wall outlet. Whoops! That tripped the GFI. Well, right, the primary heatsink is actually not grounded, but has one lead of the rectified AC attached to it. I checked the keyboard by applying 5 volts to the I.O. board and trying out the shift lock key. No response. I followed traces, measured voltages and conductivity to realize that one pin of the 23 keyboard connections got loose on the plug inside the keyboard. Guess which one? Well, that episode at least gave me an excuse to finally not only clean the case, but also the contacts of the keyboard. I also decided to add some heat sinks to the chips. I found fitting ones, but no clips to attach them. Cutting out my own it is then. Finally, after a long process, turn on, insert the dead test cartridge and watch the memory test succeed. I can now put the lid on and have fun! Well, so I thought. After putting the lid on, the old issue of the crackling speaker returned and the computer would eventually crash. During assembly I noticed that the screws that hold the back panel are actually pushing against the CPU board. So snip snip and the shorter versions now have some clearance. And finally it works, even with the attached cover. And to top it off, decals. Time to put in one of my favorite games of that era and try it out. I can't believe I managed to find the original floppy disk of it and it still works. I still have no idea how long that thing will work, but as long as it does, hooray for 80s computers!